And, and uh, John, uh, the opportunity to talk with you here today. Again, I'm Donna Bibber, CEO of Isometric. Um, looking forward to presenting here micro, uh, mold, micro needle array patches uh, as injection molding and what is possible. Uh, you'd be amazed what's possible, and uh, we're still amazed every day what's possible. So without further ado, I'll uh, get right into it here. So um, just to give you a brief um, on who is isometric, and then we'll go into a real quick slide on what is micromolding. Uh, a lot of people don't know, you know, the definition, I guess, what's kind of industry used, and then go through some micro needle array cases, which I'm sure everybody would be um, really stoked to see. So a little bit about isometric. Um, we are a niche manufacturer since 1991, uh, really started mold making back in 1991. Uh, we are in New Richmond, Wisconsin, uh, which is about 45 minutes east of Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. So we're in the western part of the state. We have two uh, facilities across the street from one another. One is the mold making and uh, fixtures for automation. And then the other is micro molding and micro automated assemblies. You know, ISO class seven clean room, um, ISO 1345 certified, about 120 employees. And um, we do materials from thermoplastic to LSR, two shot, implant grades of uh, polymers, uh, guide wires, metals, inserts. And we also do 3D printing of the thermosets. So that's a little bit about us. Um, defining micromolding. Uh, so a lot of people don't think, when they think micromold, they think of a part that's maybe this size. Um, and it is, it's definitely truly micromolding, but it also encompasses a lot more than that. It's it's unusual to have parts this small molded at all. Um, and you can see the plastic pellet here uh, to give it a sense of scale. And that's the part on top of the pellet and the part actually fits in the fingerprint ridge of the finger. Um, there's another here that's uh, certainly tiny, um, thousand parts per plastic pellet, 0. 0.00004 grams. Uh, this one over here has got 3,000 legs coming off of it. You can kind of barely see them, and then the rest is scrap in here. So those are truly micro, but um, the definition really is it's either fractions of a plastic pellet, fractions of a gram, weighing, uh, you know, wall thickness of, of five or 15 thousandths of an inch or somewhere around there, or even less, uh, micro molding, to micron tolerances, and then some crazy aspect ratio, whether it's length to thickness or length to diameter ratio, but it's also micro features on, uh, and tight tolerances on smaller parts. For example, this one here is about the size of a quarter and uh, I do have one, one of these on my desk here. So this part, when you would look at it, you go, well, that's not really, what's, what's micro about that? Um, but it has a 250 micron channel that goes all the way down to three microns. So the, the core that made that this channel is micro and how we measure the three micron by three micron deep channel is also require requirement of micro. So those are the two risks. And, um, and so that's why a company might come to us versus um, some of the other contract manufacturers that are out there that don't um, er, all day, every day work to single micron tolerances. So it's, it could be a combination of these attributes, um, but most of them fit maybe on a keyboard key, something like that. But we also go up to parts that are, you know, four inches, four inches long with some micro features or some t very tight tolerances. So I'm going to get right into the micro needles um, and how we do this. And even though we tell you how we do it, it's still really difficult to do. Um, but um, to give you a sense of scale here, there's a quarter on the side of this sensor, which has three micro needles. Um, this is LCP material. Um, the needles are about, you know, a millimeter tall, but they all have a hair size core pin in the middle of each of these needle sites. So, you know, four thousandths hole in each of these. And you can see how very sharp they are, even as this is a glass filled LCP, which is an unusual material you would think for a dermal, uh, but it, it worked out really well. Um, and so this one, um, you can see nice and sharp, very, very, the end of fill really, when you've you know, got your gates on the side or whether they're on the bottom, 
the end of fill is where the needles are and right at the end is where you need it the sharpest. Um, so how we do that, and these are three about three microns in terms of their radius. Um, and so how we do that is we can picture a this is the steel, let's say, and it's the, the materials filling um, through the steel at 40 to 50,000 PSI of injection pressure. It's not, it's not unusual to have that in micro molding and 0.01 seconds. So it's fast. But as that material is filling, it's building up the gases, of course, in the material. And just like conventional molding, it has to be vented. But unlike conventional molding, the vents are between three and four microns. Um, no more, no less in this case, in this material. No more, no less, because if you have too much, then um, you're, you're going to get some flash. If you don't have enough, then it's n then the gas kind of collects here and creates a not so sharp needle, which is not good. Uh, very painful for a patient and just non-compliant, uh, basically. So really key to making this, as, as any plastic part is a key um, for getting the vents right, but in our world, it's extremely critical. Here's another one that is about an inch square, um, and this is polycarbonate, so a really thin substrate for a large part like that. And again, at the end of fill, we have this kind of curved needle. Most people, when they look at this part, would say that can't be made as an undercut, um, but we did fig figure out a very creative way to get this out of the mold and create this, this geometry. So um, again, very end of fill, lots of gates on the bottom of this one. That's not just one, there's several. Um, and at the very end of fill, very sharp. And on the, even on the ends of this, if it's kind of, you can't see the three dimensionally, but it's on the ends of this, sides of the needle is also very sharp. Uh, design considerations on this one, obviously there's multiple angles here. Um, uh, and this angle, it really matters with respect to the age of a patient. Patient. This one's for wound care, and so uh, if the patient is is older, their skin is more delicate. Or if they're very young, their babies or infants or their their skin is is very different than, than an average person, and so the severity of that angle needed to change based on a couple of different patient. Uh, population. So um, that sharpness was really too too much for, say, an older person. So we worked with uh, this particular customer to really dial that in with respect to DFM and DFA. As I said, the material is polycarbonate. Uh, we fabricate it with uh, micro-injection molding, and it's also important that we don't damage these needles as they're packaged, and so they're packaged in such a way um, in hot, very high speed and, and high volume that the needles are not damaged. Um, and that's a stack actually, but it, believe it or not. Um, this, this is another one that's a micro needle drug delivery uh, for insulin. Uh, this is a polycarbonate hub and over uh, insert molded into a stainless steel needle. And so handling these needles and getting them uh, located in the right direction as well, because um, it's really important to have these consistent. Uh, so it was, you can see it's kind of um, adjacent to the gate here. Um, these are also packaged in trays to kind of fit for the next automation stage of their, of their lives. Uh, this one's a bioresorbable. Um, I don't know if you're all familiar with bioresorbable, but it's a material that is PLLA, a polylactic acid, which is milk-based material. And it uh, goes in the body and turns into carbon dioxide and water after it's done its job. It's designed to degrade, um, and that's its job is to degrade at some point in time. Uh, sometimes it's weeks and sometimes it's a year or more before it degrades, but it needs to stay strong and then degrade. Uh, so that's a challenge for us. This material is very difficult because of the, the properties designed to degrade. We can't overheat it or it's very susceptible to moisture. Um, and so that this has to be processed uh, in such a way that uh, we avoid those two things as much as possible to make sure that we keep the chemistry intact of the material to then degrade at the proper cycle time for itself. 
So it's really difficult to do this, um, but it's also um, the, the, the challenge here, as you can see, is the inside diameter here is eight thousandths of an inch. So two hair size uh, core pins in the middle here. Again, the facets that you see here are molded in. Uh, there's no secondary operations here. Uh, 16 thousandths OD, and it's an 18 to one aspect ratio. Uh, really high aspect ratio. So we're we're used to doing these long and thin things where, you know, core and cavity registration is really, really key. Because uh, if, even if you're off by, you know, a couple of tenths of a thousandth of an inch, you're going to get, you know, flow down the fat side and leave the thin side short. So it's really important to have that core and cavity registration. And it's also important, equally important to have that two sized, uh, two, two X hair size core pin held in place with respect to A to B side. And so we're, we're holding on to that core pin on, on the A so that it, that it doesn't, uh, you know, wiggle around during that very high injection pressure and speed. Here's another one, LCP, um, a really high aspect ratio here. Uh, so 17,000, it's a little bigger ID here, but uh, the same premise here for uh, sharpness on the very end, uh, 28,000 OD, and it's a 40 to one aspect ratio. LCP has got many different grades. And as you may know that at, in its unfilled state, it's very brittle. And so it needs really a filler. In most cases, it needs a, a, a good filler to give it some strength. So there are some materials, um, glass filled materials or mineral filled that uh, give it its strength. So it's a, it's a good go-to because it, of course, it doesn't, uh, it's a very controlled shrink, very, very little shrink material. Now these, these um, are printed, 3D micro printed where uh, we have we have three micro printers, and I want to say three that are just a step above the micro uh, in house, and we do a lot of printing here. And it's just for scale, um, these needles here, and if you can see my cursor, have uh, they're about three quarters of a millimeter high, or thirty thousandths high, and you can see that um, they're very very sharp, and so this will replicate something that we can mold later on as a micro needle array. So if you're trying to down select geometry, um, this is a really good way to do that uh, because it's very peak like this material is strong. Um, you could see a couple of different ones here as a cone, more of a cone shape. And then we have that kind of the gradual that's more a little more um, robust with respect to uh, the depth that this needle would be able to go. So uh, really a good replicator. It's also um, a way to create, uh, again, geometry really fast, get it in your hands, kind of get it around a, a conference table to see what your actual part will look like. And it also allows uh, uh, us to do some DFM and DFA, even on the printed parts before they're, they're molded because Again, you want to try to do as much as you can prior to even making the printed parts so that when you're doing some testing, it's going to be something that's real that would later on be replicated as a molded part even. But surprisingly, there's also materials out there as printed that are bioresorbable. They're ready to go with respect to um, 10993. But there are there are some that are actually through FDA, and there are some that are kind of right big piggybacking behind it to FDA to actually have a master device file, which is pretty exciting to be printing parts that are that are that will be used at some point uh, here in the future in the near future. Um, in terms of packaging for bioresorbables, um, obviously nitrogen sealed foil pouch and, and getting all the air out because remember it's it's susceptible to moisture and to heat. So we want to make sure we get all the elements away from the needles that they don't start to degrade uh, before their time. What's really important when we're doing any parts, whether it's uh, micro needles or any other micro features, it's really important to get a, um, to have a how, to have a really process that's very tight window. For example, if, Parts have plus or minus three uh, micron or eight micron in this case um, tolerances. 
but they still need to be 1.33 CPK, it's really important to break down the process of where we're gonna find those microns. And so right out of the gate, we know that we need to make that tooling to 20% of tolerance to give 80%, the rest of the 80% to take up in the rest of the process that it will see. So the tooling right out of the gate, is so critical and such the enabler. Um, when we have a 40 person shop here, which is probably the largest of any of the micro molders, uh, I think it is the largest. And, um, and so that allows us um, to be very reactive, very quick, and also to do multiple mold projects and multiple assembly projects. We do our own automation here in house as well. So starting with the tooling again, 20%, then we're, we've got gauge r and which is industry standard 20%. But thankfully we have some uh, CT scan and some other things that'll kind of drop that down to 10%. Molding process is generally, again, generally 20%. Material drying, 10% generally. With bioresorbs, it might be more, uh, more of a critical. Um, and then uh, material lot to lot variation, 10 and a couple others. But each project is different, but this is just generally speaking, this is what we would do, uh, again, as a culture, because we're, we're dealing literally with submicron to find out where the microns will be. Um, really important to have these other factors too, scientific molding, micro molding, um, our shot size and our are matched to residence time for that material. So they're between two gram and 14 gram that allows that material to let sit there and bake in either the, the, the barrel or in the uh, hot runner in some cases. So uh, really, really important to break this down and really have a culture of your organization to do this. The other um, uh, method to look at micro needles and other micro molded parts uh, might be, uh, you know, we have a key ins with a VKX that has 28,000 X uh, magnification on it, um, which is a great way to look at micro needles. But there are other things that we can do with those, such as a DOE, which helps us to understand where the variation is in the material. It might not get the very tip of the needle. So that's really, I wanna make that really clear that CT scanning may not be the best to look at the sharpness of the needle, but all other aspects of the process, um, even looking inside the part, like this one is here where my cursor is, and looking, do we have bubbles or inclusions or you know any kind of things in, inside the part that we're not looking for? Did the, did the pin shift over? This is a really good way to do that. And so what we're doing here is we're out at the molding machine. It's a SODIC uh, press, and we have a, a lot of SODIC presses. Uh, really great machine goes down to one micron uh, positional accuracy of injection, which is crazy and really, really helpful uh, in enabling as well. So um, what we're doing here is a DOE, say it's 11 point DOE. We pass them through to our um, metrology lab and you know even even 16 cavities can be um, scanned at one time so this rotates in front of the x-ray and in front of the detector and then so it rotates and it creates a point cloud and then that point cloud gets laid over the perfect solid model as shown here so this is the solid perfect solid model and this is the actual uh, molded part and then it gets po put over that and then you get these 16 different color deviation plots and the scale here is two and a half microns. So we can see in within 15 minutes a full first article. This is programmed once and you only have to do that once. And now we are 15 minutes determining which of those process variables were most influential to the critical to quality attributes. So we do that, we thought, oh, we can't go that pressure, speed or temperature, we can't go that high. Let's start to go back down again and rinse and repeat and continue to do that until we understand what our full process variation is and where our process window wants to be. Uh, really critical for uh, single micron tolerance parts and been really helpful. We've had it for eight years. And so we've really been fantastic um, learning curve for us to really use this to the best of our ability. Now, the other use to this is if the we send the customer the STL file, and they will use that STL file going back to their FEA assumption, their finite element, 
and put the actual STL back into those by all those variables we just did, put them all back in to be sure that their assumptions were, were accurate with theoretical data. Um, and the other use is everyone can understand this on a clinical submission. So if these are used, these color deviation plots or the actual uh, point cloud is used, it's really easy for a clinical submission person to understand what's going on there. Uh, and one other thing um, with respect to uh, that microns matter. So that's just for components that I talked about. Now if we're talking about multiple part assemblies, such as a wearable insulin pump or a continuous insulin pump that goes under the skin, which we also have done both of these here at Isometric. Um, it's important to look at the full assembly stack up, that full factorial of era of eight cab is this, 16 of that, 32 of that, two guide wires, two, maybe a couple of um, purchase components, and they all need to stack up. All that full factorial needs to stack up to be 1.33 CPK. So it's really, again, this is even more critical, not just looking at one component, but looking at all those cavities, all that error, all those um, CT scans of the process, and understanding what uh, the criticality, again, is of the function of the device and how the process variables might affect that. Um, here's a, also a good example of per purchase components, or any lot for that matter. If you have a CPK and you want to have it nice and tight, and you get one lot that comes in as the green shows, it's nice and tight, but it's it's over here and on the, on the low side, excuse me, on the high side, not low side, and one that comes nice and nominal right in the middle, and then one on the high side, well, we can deal with that. We can deal with three different shutoffs if we have to, um, because we're talking about microns and really submicron, but if, the, if one lot comes in and takes up all that, we're in trouble because we're going to shut off that mold, you know, sometimes damage mold if it's off or sometimes flash if it's off. So it's really important to look at it this way and have that kind of culture uh, to look at it in a, in a way that maybe we don't necessarily do in conventional molding. And then lastly, I think it's really important that we all are looking for being at the top of the value pyramid. We want to be Beyond OEMs are kind of in the yellow, almost to the top, but really beyond an OEM medical or drug delivery device is intellectual property, and um, building that from the ground up is it's, it's kind of an interesting place to be in micro molding, and when you're doing things like this that are kind of the, the improbable or impossible, and that is uh, when 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 somebody is looking at a presentation like this. They're going, oh, wow, what could I build with that? What are the enabling technologies of the intellectual properties that 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 micro molding can enable? And that's a good place to be rather than here, make this and, you know, kind of do your best with this. We're showing this can be made. What can, what else can be made using the technology? What can be sharp? What can be uh, molded? What can be economically feasible because it's injection molding in the end? So. Um, just want to show that. Uh, so in closing, you can see that with uh, micro needles and miniaturized devices, um, we're really controlling and preserving the integrity of data all the way through because we have this kind of wheel of molding, tooling, automation, assembly, and having that in-house and controlling that data is really, really critical for single micron tolerances. Um, and then our how is using that microns matter process to really achieve uh, single micron tolerances for parts and assemblies uh, and uh, micro needle arrays uh, and still achieve 1.33 CPK. Continuous investment is really important to stay ahead of uh, the technology and kind of keep moving the decimal point. So with that, I think we're um, we're going to take questions uh, on the call is. Uh, Brent Honigan and myself, and we're, we're open to the questions. And thank you so much for taking the time to log in here on the webinar. We really appreciate uh, seeing you and looking forward to talking with you about any application that you would have that's that you saw here or uh, would need that's tiny and precise. 
Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Donna. That was great. Uh, we do have quite a few questions here, so we'll see what we can get to. But if uh, if you do have any more, just type them in through the chat function here to the host, myself, and and hopefully we'll we'll get to as many as we can. So, um, so if, let's see here. Just bear with me. So. Question here, do you measure micro needle array molds after mold making, for example, EDM or micro milling? Uh, we, we measure the molded component because again, with shrink and uh, you know, and how the, the, the parts being molded, we of course we measure the steel itself uh, if, we're, if we're meeting what we expect it to be, but that ultimately we're looking at the molded components to measure so we understand, especially differential shrink, and at, at this level of how what we're accomplishing at the, for the final product. But we we measure after we build the mold, and most importantly after we mold the part. Got it. Okay. Um, can you mold multiple needles close together? <clears throat> yes, we can do very dense. Uh, uh, amount of needles in a very small amount of space uh, tends to be the aspect ratio of what you're looking for. Uh, but yes, we, you know, needle, micro needle patch arrays are, are, are things that we specialize in or array patches uh, are things that we specialize in. And we have had extremely dense uh, uh, number of needles uh, in some cases, you know, a couple hundred. So it could be numerous uh, and can be quite dense. Uh, so it's all, we can help you with all those DFM questions um, to help you realize what you're looking for. Many times uh, I will say that someone will come to us uh, looking for a solution. And during that period of time, they made concessions because they didn't think something was possible. So they designed around what they really wanted and designed what they thought was possible. And we like to take a step back and ask, you know, what, what, would, you, what would you really like to have? And many cases, we can help them actually go back and, and those design concessions that they felt, you know, you know, couldn't be manufactured. We've helped them manufacture those. So it can be quite dense as well as, you know, we're, we're an enabling factor for our customers. And I would encourage you not to make design concessions based on conceived limitations. And please reach out and ask us questions so we can help you. Very good. Couple couple related questions here, so maybe I'll I'll loop them together. So, is is molding these micro needle arrays uh, patches expensive? And and kind of along that same line, you know, would isometric versus a you know more traditional molder or a non micro molder be more expensive in general? Yeah, no, we're we're very competitive. Uh, micro, even though our our whole business, you know, just. The guy did a great job with the presentation, but we've been doing this for over 30 years. And, and during that time, we've done over a thousand projects and built countless molds. And, and we've really fine tuned our expertise in precision, ultra precision and, and micro. Uh, and as Donna was talking about, we, we can do these larger parts as well, definitely up to four to six inches if it has a thin wall, a micro feature or a tight tolerance. And, you know, we talked about these micron tolerances. If your project needs plus or minus two thousands, that, that just tells you we can do that too. Uh, but we can also do very tight tolerances. But when it comes down to expense, I think that's one of the things, you know, we, we get asked that question often, is micro mean you're more expensive? And, and that's not the case. Uh, we're growing quite rapidly and, and, you know, we're told that we're quite competitive. And so I would definitely challenge uh, you to investigate us along with your let's say your, your normal molder uh, for expense, I think will be quite competitive. And again, we're, the, the, you know, we don't know this. It, it's, it has to come from customer feedback and the feedback that has been quite positive that we have this great capability and it's uh, economical to go with, with us on projects. Very good. So on average, how long does it take to qualify or validate a new product? I'll take that one. I, I yeah, would please. say that it's, yeah, it's, it's maybe, um, 
you know, if you're if you're looking for an implant, for example, that might be a little bit longer, um, just because our customers take a lot longer to for the answers to kind of come back and forth with respect to OQ um, and, uh, and and the and the variation. But in general, um, you're looking for a medical device. Uh, I would say that our validation is somewhere around ten weeks or so, or, or you know, maybe less um, in some cases, but. Uh, mold build on average is eight weeks or 10 weeks uh, right now. Uh, right after COVID, it was much higher than that, but it seems to have kind of settled back in a little bit. But I would say, you know, eight weeks to build a mold, kind of eight or 10 to validate something like that, generally. All right. Uh what is a typical shot size for a, a micro needle array? And then there was one rel related to that. Um, maybe you can speak to how many cavities is typical as well. Yeah, um, you know, a micro needle that you saw just a single would be, you know, a pretty small shot size. And so what we end up doing is we have to, uh, in some cases, especially with the bioresorb one, we, we have to make sure that that is not, you know, a residence time that's going to sit there and bake. But in most cases, for those teeny tiny parts that are one offs like that, they we have to add a, like a little toothpick or less of material to um, to make sure that that is, you know, enough volume that's that's taking up enough of the shot that a uh, has less residence time or B um, can uh, get a revolution of the screw that is at least a quarter or a half of a revolution of the screw. Um, the second part of your question was how big the arrays can be. Um, and those can be, you know, as, as large as, you know, four by four or as small as, you know, half inch by half inch array, um, depending on, um, you know, the application. And going back to cavitation, so we can do multi multiple cavity. Typically, array starts with one cavity, and then we can we can go to multiple cavity. We have currently done that for customers, uh, so multi cavity is possible. Uh, and also tying into what Donna said, you know, cycle time plays into this. So if we can have a really quick cycle time, you know, we can that residence time is reduced because we're we're getting more parts out. And so that's one of the things that we can do is you know we can mold with rapid. Uh, cycle times, as well as we can optimize gate and runner systems to really minimize resin uh, to so there's very little scrap. And uh, so it, it is a combination of, you know, if it's something that's going to require a longer cycle time and what we have to do with residence time versus quick, quick, quick cycles and what we can get through the system. So we, we look at all of that. We, we take a very scientific approach to molding and, and how we approach projects and we risk mitigate all the way through. And that's part of that risk mitigation, how we create a, a sustainable solution. Uh, next one here, do you build mold with hot runners? We mostly do hot to cold uh, if we have an, uh, the application that, you know, in micro needle arrays um, with the geometry that we just showed, um, those would be more hot to cold related, especially if it's, you know, a material that doesn't like a lot of heat. Uh, because you've just spent all this time to talk about residence time, and then you put it into a, a large uh, hot runner that um, is going to put more heat into it. So it's unusual uh, for us to have uh, anything hot runner. We might do hot to cold to reduce that for very high volume applications, you know, tens to hundreds of millions of parts annually. Then you want to try to reduce that as much as you can. Um, as Brent said, with um, really looking at the the runner scrap that we have, there's not a lot of heat in because the parts are small, so there's not a lot of heat to take out with except for the runner. So we want to reduce that to so that the cycle time, um, which is usually the runner with really small parts, is not um, is is not preventing you from having an economical and scalable uh, process. So hopefully we can get this one right here, kind of a detailed question. How does isometric keep the fourth out diameter core pin straight during molding 
and then piloting into a fixed half. Hopefully yeah. we got that right. Yeah, I, I talked about that in one of the slides and really it's just, um, you know, it's piloted exactly right, but it's held in place um, even with a very small insert, even if that core pin can go in just slightly, it's going to be held in place on both A and B because we cannot, it's really difficult to do a blind hole, for example, in a very long and thin um, hollow applications or, you know, blind because now we can't hold that core pin somewhere, that very small core pin. In the event that we do have that, we would ask for, and this is very unusual to have it, as a side hole to hold that core pin in place. There's gotta be something that either the pilot uh, insert or uh, some kind of side feature that can hold that core pin in place at that, at that size level, because you're just gonna break core pins in, in that you know, in that design. So the mold design and the robustness of that design is really, really key to getting your full depreciation value and not, you know, validating and revalidating um, from broken core pins. So there, there's ways to do that and there's ways not to do that. And one of them is to not hold on to that core pin correctly. If I could add to that one just real quickly. So the one you, the, one, the example that was given at the 4,000 supports, that does not have a side hold on it. Uh, that's an aspect ratio of 40 to 1. Um, we're also, we, we're molding all the way down to 20 micron or 0 0.0008 foul thick uh, holes. So not, now that's not this example right here, uh, but I just wanted to share, you know, when you're talking about, you know, drug delivery, you know, we're going all the way down to 20 micron holes. So think about that. That's, you know, significantly, you know, 20% of a human hair. Uh, and we're also holding that without, side hold side 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 support um so it's pretty pretty just darn amazing you know what we're able to get down to but that's that, that a lot of a lot of experience a lot of science a lot of experimentation that has allowed us to get to this level and we're getting down to you know 20 20 micron core pins um with with fairly long aspect ratios the other thing i wanted to point out an example that donna had up earlier we're doing that in a bioresorbable material you know, one of the concerns about micro needles is adding to adding sharps to landfill. Uh, and so if the needle is going to go in your body or for, for delivering a drug, let's say it's a swallowable, swallowable device or something like that, or if it's going to be on the outside, you know, the beauty of this material, even though it is more expensive, is that you can, you know, there will be no adding to the landfill. This will degrade. And uh, I just, uh, I think that's, you know, being conscious of, of, of what these disposable products uh, and having material work and mold down to three micron tips uh, in, a, in a needle that will, will, will go away over time, I think is, uh, I think, I, I think is an exciting future for all of us. And I'll add one more thing to that. Um, who asked about the, the, the fourth out core pin. You can see on this example, this is the mold itself for this part. Um, and you can see the receivers it's a little bit fuzzy, but you can see the receivers for each of those three core pins here. So really important to get, and it's difficult to make that, uh, but it's really important to get those aligned correctly, uh, the mold aligned correctly, and the, uh, you know, obviously the core pins held in place, um, as I said. So uh, really good, good question, though. Oops. Great. Question here is, do you make molds for external molders? For the for the most part, no. Uh, but we have, and we we have historically, uh, and for a lot of customers that we've had for the for over the last thirty years, we we still do. Uh, but we prefer to help you with the full solution, uh, with the which would include molding as well as automated assembly afterwards. Now. Um, I understand a lot of people want to do things in themselves, uh, and the mold is 100% an enabling factor to that. But when you look at the project as a whole, I, I would encourage you to do that. The master designer and tool builders that help create these molds are also the same people that are maintaining them, repairing them, uh, and keeping them, you know, so you can get that full, like you said, the full amount of the parts you thought you could get off this tool to amortize correctly and for your investment, as well as you as hopefully your project expands, being able to duplicate that and keep that maintenance going forward. Having an all-in-house 
uh, as well as the people are gonna have to fine tune the processing, working with the people are gonna have to fine tune the mold. You know, it's not pointing fingers, it's that they're collaborating together extremely well. So we would prefer uh, in our business model is to help mold the parts, is to mold the parts for you or, or do a sub-assembly or a full assembly after we mold the parts. Again, keeping that datum structure and putting it into an assembly. We're world-class uh, with our automation systems. Uh, um, amazing, truly amazing uh, positional accuracy um, down to where we have a project where we're doing one and a half micron positional accuracy uh, with a spec that's plus or minus five micron. And, uh, you know, we would love to be able to help you support you through not only the, the molding, but also through the assembly uh, aspects, even all the way to packaging. Uh, but definitely a, a sub-assembly where we're combining something together, keeping the data structure right out of the mold, not adding bio burden, not adding labor, not adding expense of, re, of repositioning afterwards, and putting it into a package that protects uh, and, and can be shipped around the world. We ship around the world every day, uh, and so, uh, or during the week at least, and uh, would be happy to help you with those type of projects. Very good. The question here is, what might be an average number of parts that you would run per product per year? Um, might, might be tough there, but maybe given if you have an example or what's, what's typical for you guys. Don, would you like that one? I sure would. Um, so we have, um, for the first time, I just, uh, we're about to get a project that is, believe it or not, in the, with a 1 billion, um, and that is in, in a micro needle. Um, I can't believe that's true, um, because in my 30 years, 30 plus 34 years, I've not seen that number. But generally speaking, the parts are in the tens of millions to hundreds of millions. Um, and some are less than that. Some are even a thousand parts a year. So it all depends on, is it a good fit for us with respect to material, something we've done before? Is it something that we can add value to? Um, so, um, but the, the markets that we're in uh, being interocular, uh, robotic surgery, drug delivery, cardio, um, kind of those are, those volumes of those markets are kind of all over the map. Um, but that's where we play in and that's where we're we can show real value to our customers. Uh, microfluidics uh, diagnostics is another one. So um, they do get in a really high volumes for diabetes, for example, or um, you know drug delivery uh, through uh, all parts of the world globally, trying to to create uh, micro needles that can be drop shipped from you know anywhere uh, in the in the case of a pandemic or epidemic. So. Um, after COVID, those things went crazy uh, with respect to the need and and um, you know, needs assessment. But you know, they I guess average. If I was going to pick an average of those, it would be millions a year, um, single millions a year. We definitely have projects that start off at a thousand. There's no, I mean, no doubt. Uh, but Donna is definitely talking about the, our higher volume ones. But we have customers, you know, that you know can be lower. Uh, and then they go to 50 to 100,000, but everything everything she said was spot on. Definitely, you know, excited to say we've got a project that starts with a B for billion. Uh, but, you know, again, some people, you know, that are starting out are in low volume. And if, it, you know, if we're a right fit, you know, we're, we're happy to help you as well. Very good. I, I think, I know we, uh, we want to end here around around this time, not to keep everybody too long, but I, I'd like to ask one more here and then we'll let you guys close. So, um, of course, you know, you guys see the emails on the screen there. So I know Don and Brent be happy to take your questions afterwards um, if you want to reach out directly to them. But maybe we'll make this the last one and, and then I'll let you guys kind of uh, summarize. So how do you manage lot to lot material vari variation? Some materials are very wide. Do you change the molding process to adapt to that viscosity difference? That's a fantastic question. It's really hard for micro molders to get three lots of material at any given time because we manufacturing lots. And that's really key to understanding the lot. Um, working with a material supplier, it's really key to understanding their lot nomenclature and making sure that there are three manufacturing lots uh, that are different. 
um, because sometimes they'll send some to distribution and sometimes direct. So uh, really hard to get three, but we get two uh, when we can, um, and that's most of the time. And how we do that is, uh, you know, you're absolutely right, is that the, the uh, viscosity uh, melt flow rate might come in again, it might come in one time over here and one time over here. That's ideal for us because now we've shown the gamut along with the 11 point DOE. Now we bring in the lot to lot variation into that DOE to determine what did we do with the with the melt flow rate. Uh, really important. Um, it also gets extremely important when you have not only uh, the base resin melt flow rate, but now we have a colorant. And if there's a colorant added to the mix, um, that can even just one, you're talking about one pellet and a thousand parts can be made. So can you imagine that one pellet of colorant can create havoc with viscosity of material because when that's compounded, there's some error with respect to viscosity there as well. So it's really, really important to understand, uh, you know, each, each project is a little bit different. Is it pre-compounded? Is it base resin? How many lots can we get? Get as many as three, maybe four even if we can, but it's very unusual for micromolders to get more than two. Um, so, um, but it is important to get that lot to lot variation because if it's again comes in the high side one time and the low side another time, um, you can, it can be the difference between making a part and not making a part. Very good. Well, uh, like I said, you know, please reach out directly to to Donna and Brent with any other questions. I'm sure they'd be happy to help you guys out. Uh, but I just want to say thanks, Donna. I, I, that was a really awesome presentation, Brent. Brent as well. Um, you know, always always really excited to see what you guys are going to present on. So, um, and thanks everybody from from the Sodic side as well. Myself, John, and and Len Hampton, Kohei. Uh, we appreciate you know the attendance and and the feedback that we've gotten from this this webinar series. Uh, there will be more webinars to come. Uh, you will see hopefully some things on LinkedIn, and and we we don't plan on stopping as long as everybody keeps joining. So, thanks again, Donna, Brent. If you have anything to say here, I'll I'll let you take over. Yeah, thank you, Bennett. Thank you for Sodic for for putting this on, and uh, it, it's always great to work with you guys. And appreciate all the compliments and the questions. Uh, it's really one of my favorite parts of the of the presentation, and so thank you for being so engaged and uh, and giving some great questions. We're we're happy to take those those questions offline as well. Um, if you want to send those over to our sales at isomicro.com email, that'd be great. Thanks again, everyone, for for your attendance. And Brent? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Bennett, thank you for this forum and for the rest of everybody there. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity. As you can see, we're pretty passionate about what we do. We, we love this. We love that we're doing something meaningful. We love that we're doing something, in many cases, has never been done before. Um, it is what drives us. And uh, if you have a project or like to talk more, we would love to hear from you. I have added Donna's email, my email, and our, our, our general sales box, sales at isomicro.com. You can also join us at our, on our website at isomicro.com. There's a lot more, there's more pictures. Uh, they can, there's a contact us form. Uh, but again, we love this. I hope, I'm sure you do as well. And uh, reach out if you'd like to work together. Very good. Thanks everybody. Thank you. All right, thank you. Take care.